All right, well, it's the top of the hour, and so we're going to get going here. Uh, hello, and welcome to a webinar hosted by the Desert Landscape Conservation Cooperative. This is Ken Nowak with the Bureau of Reclamation, and we're very pleased to have Paul Miller here with us today from NOAA to talk about El Nino. Uh, during the webinar, please note that we'll have the conference line muted, and we'll take questions after Paul's presentation is concluded. Once he's concluded, we'll ask that you raise your hand using the webinar function. Paul will then call on you by name, and once you hear your name called, you can unmute yourself using star six. So with that, I'll take a moment to thank Paul again and turn over the presentation to him. Thanks, Paul. Great, thanks, Ken, and, and thanks uh, to the Desert LCC for, for hosting this webinar. I think, it's, I think LCCs in general are, are doing a great job, and I think the Desert LCC in particular is uh, really uh, leading the pack as far as that goes. So uh, thanks again for having us. Um, um, and, you know, I just wanted to say, uh, Ken asked if uh, we could show uh, a presentation about uh, the El Nino that's been getting a lot of press lately, and we'll talk about that and um, kind of go through what it is and, and what it isn't and um, talk about what the impacts might be for our region and uh, go forward from there. So let see if I can get the slides to advance here. There we go. So just a really quick overview of the presentation. Uh, I'll talk a little bit about the CBRC where I work, the Colorado Basin River Forecast Center. Uh, and then we'll just talk about what is uh, the El Nino Southern Oscillation and, and what causes it. Um, is this a teleconnection? Uh, that's one of those words that's been kind of thrown around. And um, I think people are kind of interested in, in what exactly a teleconnection is and, and how are we describing uh, ENSO events as a teleconnection? Uh, what are typical impacts associated with an ENSO event? And then what's the deal with this one? You know, you've, you've probably seen it in the media, you've probably seen it on the news. Um, what can we expect from this current uh, El Nino event? Uh, how does it impact uh, specifically our Colorado River Basin region and the Desert LCC region? And then how do we account for ENSO events over here at the RC? So just a quick, quick overview of what uh, we do at the River Forecast Center, because I, I like to hype us up. I feel like we're, we're a bit in the background sometimes. But uh, So there's 13 River Forecast Centers that uh, span the United States. And for you Desert LCC folks, you can kind of see there's probably three for sure that span your area. And then you probably even go a little bit into the Arkansas Red Basin uh, River Forecast Center there. Uh, but still, four, three or four offices uh, with people that are, are very, very willing to, to help you out. Uh, we're part of the Department of Commerce uh, underneath NOAA. Uh, we're actually part of the National Weather Service, um, the weather service that you're probably more familiar with and probably get, and that probably gets more attention is the weather forecast offices. They're the ones doing the everyday weather. Uh, when you get those warnings on your phone, um, they're the ones sending those things out. Uh, we're actually the, the water forecasting side of the weather service. Uh, so we provide a lot of support for the WFOs, uh, particularly when it comes to those, um, those flood warnings. Uh, we're forecasting river levels and flows, uh, reservoir inflows, and every RFC is unique. And what I would say about the CVRC is we're probably the most advanced and the most involved when it comes to seasonal water supply forecasting. Uh, we've got lots of other products too, but um, but I think we're unique in just how uh, robust our seasonal water supply forecasting is and how involved we are and we do it. Uh, we work very closely with the Bureau of Reclamation um, to provide those forecasts and they make a, a number of key decisions on it. And, and if you have a chance, uh, go check out our website. It's uh, undergone some recent improvement, but improvements lately and I think it's, um, it's really great and it's a really good resource. So, so into the meat of the talk here, what exactly is ENSO? Um, it's probably the most influential climate pattern that's used in seasonal forecasting. And what I want to stress is that you'll see a lot of papers, you'll see a lot of people saying, um, oh, you know, it's an El Nino year, so we're going to get this amount of stream flow, or it's a La Nina year, we're going to get this amount of stream flow. And really, the correlation between this climate pattern is not between the climate pattern and stream flow, it's between the climate pattern and precipitation and temperature 
and those two climatic drivers that, that do play a big role in our stream flow. But, you know, most of the time we're just using stream flow as a proxy to, um, uh, to look at precipitation over a large area. So generally if we're seeing a lot of stream flow, we can kind of assume that we've seen a lot of precipitation. So when you think of ENSO, don't think of its relationship to stream flow. Think of its relationship to precipitation and temperature. Um, it's a large-scale phenomena that we typically identify um, through sea surface temperatures along the equatorial Pacific, and I'll talk a little bit more about this. But it's a coupled uh, phenomenon. It's not just uh, the warming of ocean waters. It's, um, it's really that interaction between the ocean and the atmosphere. So it's a... Um, when we see these warming sea surface temperatures, we also need to see the atmosphere respond to those sea surface temperatures. Otherwise, it's uh, not really a, an El Nino or a La Nina, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that. So, so typically, when we're talking about El Nino, we're talking about these warmer um, uh, ocean temperatures over the equatorial Pacific, and then what we like to call weakened walker circulation, where um, we see more rainfall near the dateline and less rainfall near Indonesia. So just to kind of, so that was a lot of like fancy weather speak, <laughs> but ENSO is basically like a stove. Um, so, you know, next time you're, you're cooking tonight maybe, um, think of ENSO. Uh, but think, you know, you've got your oven and, and um, you've got what you're cooking. And so if you've got that heat, but no atmospheric response, so here we've got a heat, but the water is not Boiling, nothing's um, nothing's happening to to the um, to the atmosphere, or in this case, my my glass of uh, water. Um, this isn't an El Nino. There's no atmospheric response happening here. Sometimes we see um, uh, weather and activity um, in the regions that we're we're looking for, but without that that energy source, uh, in this case, the the warming ocean waters. Um, in the equatorial Pacific, that's not an El Nino either. Um, there's no ocean driver here. So, so those bubbles uh, that I've, I've driven are, are supposed to be boiling water. So imagine that uh, <laughs> my, my uh, PowerPoint art skills aren't, uh, aren't ideal for this. <laughs> but when we do get that energy source from the ocean and we do get that atmospheric reaction um, that, that we expect to see, then suddenly we do have what we would call an El Nino event or, or even a La Nina event um, in this case. So here's the region that we typically look at. And just to kind of get you oriented here, here's, here's Mexico. Uh, hopefully you can see my mouth uh, heading into South America. Here's the equator with the date line at about 100, well, at 180 degrees. Um, so, you know, you're going to see when people talk about uh, sea surface temperatures, you might see them uh, reference a whole bunch of areas. What we typically look at is what we call the Nino 3.4 region. It's the region that uh, researchers have uh, found to have the most correlation with um, the atmospheric response and, and those precip and temperature impacts that we'll see over North America. Uh, some other uh, areas of the world look at different regions. Um, to kind of more or less assess their, their particular impacts. But when we're talking about the U.S. and, and we're talking about the Weather Service, uh, we're typically looking at this Nino 3.4 region, which is a combination of this Nino 4 region uh, and this Nino 3 region that you see in yellow and red. Um, way back uh, when they first started noticing this phenomena, you'll see what's over here um, noted as the Nino um, one plus two. This used to be two regions before they just kind of merged them together and, and just called it the, the Nino one plus two uh, region. Uh, but that one's not used too much anymore. So, so this is kind of the region that we're, we're typically looking at. And so when you're interested in what those sea surface temperatures are, um, you have to think that we're not looking at the actual magnitude of the temperatures. We're actually looking at the departures from um, average of those sea surface temperatures. And we look at this on a seasonal basis because there's a lot of uh, uh, noise kind of in the day-to-day the -day 
temperatures of um, of that uh, that particular region. So you can go to uh, the CPC's website, and I have a link to all these different kinds of graphics and um, data sets at the end, so, so don't worry about that. Um, but our current data set that we're using goes back to about 1950, and what you'll see here is you'll see the years kind of lined up on your left and, and the, the seasonal um, periods kind of up to the right. And what you can see here is since 2002, we've seen some, uh, you know, moderate and weak uh, El Nino um, episodes come through, uh, noted in red, and the blue La Nina where you have the cooler waters happening in the um, equatorial Pacific, uh, noted in blue. So you can see we've had a, a few, uh, you know, moderate La Nina episodes uh, sprung in there too. But what you'll see lately over the last, um, you know, more than the last few months here, is that we've seen this uh, ramp up in temperatures. And typically when we're talking about El Nino or La Nina, we're looking for uh, a consecutive period of temperature departures that are a half degree C or warmer um, or cooler in the case of La Nina for five consecutive periods. So you can see this current event, if we had just been at that 0.5 threshold uh, for the January, February, March period, this would have extended back into late 2014. That's just how warm these waters have been. But since we had that little break in, in January, February, March, uh, it, it's really been since February that we've seen this consistent uh, warm water over the sea, uh, over that equatorial uh, Pacific area. And I was kind of bummed that they weren't able to update the September, October, November period uh, here, because I, I think it's breaking two degrees C now, but I'm not. 100% sure, but once you get, you know, into that two degree C area, um, you're really starting to talk about a strong El Nino event, and, and that's what you've probably heard of um, coming into this presentation. So now that we've got the ocean part down, how do we monitor the, the atmospheric part to make sure that we're really in uh, El Nino events? So uh, these are outgoing long uh, wave anomalies. And, you know, I'm not a great meteorologist, <laughs> so I rely on a lot of the, the folks over at the Climate Prediction Center uh, to look at these uh, different plots. But what I've highlighted here is um, looking at the weather patterns and sort of the weather activity. You can see that we're seeing more rainfall um, uh, along the dateline or along the equator here. And then we're seeing uh, drier um, precip over Indonesia. So we've got all that checked. Um, when we kind of take a look at the wind, we see anomalous westerly surface winds um, also along the equator. Uh, we've also checked the, that off. So, so now we're pretty confident that we're in a, an El Nino uh, event. We're, we're really um, confident about that. And there's lots of other things that we could look at, uh, but these are basically um, what we look at when we're looking to see if we're in an El Nino or a La Nina event. Uh, so, you know, we also want to see if this is, if we're projecting to stay in this condition. Uh, we don't want to say, hey, it's a, we're in an El Nino or we're in a La Nina um, if we don't think we're going to stay there. Um, what Columbia University does with their Institute of uh, uh, in Research Institute, uh, International Research Institute, that's the acronym there. Um, they look at a whole bunch of different models, and you can see some of these even go off of their their scale here. But, you know, if you look at this kind of pale line, I don't know why the CPC chose, like, the, the color that you can barely see, but that's kind of the general consensus of what uh, the climate models are saying. And you can see that, you know, this sea surface temperature anomaly we're expected to stay above that 0.5 threshold, um, you know, at least into early spring for the most part. Most of the, the models tend to agree there. Um, so you won't, so, you know, we, we're fairly confident that we're staying in this um, El Nino um, event. Once a month, uh, a lot of the forecasters and, and climate uh, folks get together and they, they start looking at what are the chances that, um, will be in an El Nino or a La Nina or a neutral event going forward. And you can kind of see here in the lines of the climate, uh, 
climatological means here. And so you can see like, you know, about a third of the time we're, we're usually in one event or, or another, uh, at least this time of the year. Uh, but right now what we're seeing is we're, we're forecasting a 100% that we'll be in an El Nino um, event at least through uh, January. And then, you know, that it still stays a very high likelihood that we'll stay through, um, through early spring. And then a pretty good chance that we'll return to neutral conditions by, by late spring, um, early fall uh, next year. Oops. And there we go. So that's a lot of stuff to keep up on. And, and you know, if you're not in the, the meteorologic world or the hydrologic world, um, it's, it's just a lot of variables to, to keep up on. But, but luckily there's some really great NOAA resources. And uh, like I said earlier, I'll have a link at the, I have a list at the end of the presentation um, that, you, that you're all welcome to have um, that kind of goes through a bunch of these different resources. Um, but you can really just go to our website or the NOAA uh, website for uh, El Nino and it'll tell you right then and there if you're in an El Nino um, or a La Nina event and, and then you can kind of read the synopsis and, and kind of get the summary information um, that you're looking for. So the big question that, that a lot of people have been asking is, is this a, is this a teleconnection? And so I took this video from uh, climate.gov, and, and hopefully it's coming through um, uh, over the webinar. But basically, you get these warm waters down here. You can kind of see that warming thing. And all that energy gets transferred up into the jet stream here. And as that kind of cruises uh, through the, the United States, it sets up this low pressure system off the coast of Alaska and kind of another high pressure system up here in Canada and then another low pressure system here near uh, Florida and the, the Gulf of Mexico. But this kind of setup allows for, um, you know, see kind of this, this uh, stream here of moisture uh, to come through the, the lower half of the United States. And so when we're talking about a teleconnection, we're talking about, we're looking at these warm waters, this warm energy source way off in the equatorial Pacific and then we're talking about low and high pressure systems over the continental U.S. Uh, we're talking distances of, of thousands of, of kilometers here. That's, that's really what a teleconnection is, is when you're looking at one event very far away and another event um, that's also far away and noticing um, a, a correlation or a correspondence between them. So, so that's what a teleconnection is. So again, it's it's just a fancy way of saying that one long distance event, one, one event is related to another event uh, over a very long distance. It's kind of like telephone, where if you were to call somebody from New York um, in California, um, you could see a reaction to the person that picks up um, that call from New York. So, so a long distance, um, it's a lot like telephone teleconnection. Um, one thing uh, I wanted to, to mention is that all ENSO events are teleconnections, but not all teleconnections are ENSO events. So, you know, El Nino um, and ENSO in general, you know, it, it's popular because uh, for two reasons. Um, the first being that I think uh, it's got a cool name, and so it's, it's, um, it's got some media uh, savvy to it. And then two, the ENSO event's really one of those uh, few teleconnections where we see uh, a bit of a lead time that helps us with our forecasting. We can see the ocean uh, waters warming. Uh, we can monitor that. Uh, we have models that, that tend to capture that warming trend and, and project it pretty well. And then we do have some skill uh, when we look at it to forecast um, weather events and, and weather, and I shouldn't say weather events, climate events um, over the continental U.S. Uh, relatively with some skill. So, um, so that's really the benefit there of ENSO. There's lots of other ones. There's the Pacific Decadal uh, Oscillation. There's the Atlantic uh, Multi-Decadal Oscillation. There's NAOs and AOs and, and lots of other um, abbreviations with uh, O's and, and decadals in them. But um, 
this is the one that, that's really helpful for us just because it provides us with a lead time and we have models that, that can actu accurately uh, capture it a bit. So just kind of looking at the general impacts over the, the continental U.S., we typically look at the ENSO impacts over winter just because that's when um, um, it's more influential. In the summer, things like convective thunderstorms, things your monsoons, those tend to be more important. Uh, but during the winter, that's when we see kind of this wetter uh, band come through the southern portion of the United States, uh, kind of a warmer portion towards the north, and and uh, Florida gets pretty wet too. One thing I wanted to put, point out, and one reason I like this graphic here, is you kind of see this no man's land here where, where there's no correlation there. There's just this band here. Hopefully you can see my cursor. Um, kind of through central Utah, central Colorado, northern Arizona Zona and, and northern New Mexico. Uh, we don't have a lot of skill uh, relating uh, climate patterns with uh, the ENSO signal there. So, you know, from from my perspective, that's kind of a bummer because it'd be really great if I had something that could tell me, hey, I'm looking at a really wet year in the upper Colorado River Basin since it's so important to water supply. Um, but, you know, it's, it's definitely useful information for us to look at from the point of view of the lower Colorado River Basin and for those of you with the desert LTC. Um, another uh, important source of information. But we can't really say, for instance, like Powell or any of these really uh, large reservoirs, or even like Mead for that matter, are really going to benefit from the ENSO signal this year just because there's not really that strong correlation here. And just to drive that point home, so this is a really cool graphic, I think. Um, from uh, climate.gov's ENSO blog, which I'll put a plug in for at the end because it's, it's just a, a really great source of information. But what you'll see up here is uh, six strong El Nino events, and the bluer um, colors tend to uh, represent wetter conditions, and the orange-reddish colors tend to indicate drier conditions. And here's all the strong El Nino events, and, and this one's going to uh, fall into that, that category. And you can see just there's a pretty uh, big, uh, there's a lot of variability in, in where, in what happens here. You can kind of see that in general, there's kind of this wetter kind of band that goes through the southern part of the continental U.S. But for instance, if you look at 91, 92, a strong El Nino year, northern California, very dry. Um, if you look at 19, six, where's the 60s here? I think this one's 65, 66 up here in your top right corner. Uh, very dry conditions in California. Not a whole lot of moisture in the Colorado River Basin aside from maybe the southern area of Arizona. Um, kind of looking through some of the other El Nino events, uh, you can get down to this moderate event here. Here's um, 68, 69, if I'm reading uh, correctly. Very, very wet year for California there. Uh, 2004, 2005, a weak El Nino event that brought a lot of precip to Southern California, Southern um, part of the, the Colorado River Basin. So lots of variability uh, to keep in mind here. So, so now that we've kind of given you the broad overview about what El Nino is and, and what the typical impacts are, um, what about this El Nino? And there's, there's lots of reasons to be interested in um, uh, this El Nino, and, and the media has played a, a big role in getting the word out about uh, this event um, because it could have some big impacts. Um, California, you guys know, I'm sure, is in a, a historical drought. Um, uh, there's the potential for widespread flooding, even um, especially in light of all the wildfires that were in California. You've got uh, areas that are, are susceptible to landslides under extreme precipitation events. The agricultural business is interested in this um, for both the good and the bad. You know, it could bring great water uh, supply for crops, or it could cause some flooding that might damage some crops. But, you know, uh, the media really latched onto this, I think, because someone thought it'd be really cool to call it the Godzilla El Nino. And, you know, I was thinking about this the other day, 
And it is kind of cool that somebody decided to, to coin this term because it gets a lot of us talking about this and it provides opportunities like this webinar for, for us to, to talk and um, share what we know. Uh, but, but in the Weather Service and in NOAA, we don't, we don't have Godzilla El Ninos. We just have weak, moderate, and strong El Ninos. Uh, so the Climate Prediction Center has identified uh, six strong events. And um, like you might imagine, you can't really draw a whole lot of conclusions from six strong events. Um, but that's kind of what we've, we've been looking at. So when we're, we're thinking about um, uh, trying to find comparable events for this particular um, El Nino event, these are the six that we're, we're looking at. And so what I did here was I, I just uh, plotted up all the, uh, the oceanic Nino index values. Those are those um, uh, temperature departures that I was showing earlier on. And I just plotted them up for each season. And then I took those, those six strong events and plotted them along with the current, um, um, what I'm calling the 2016 season here. And so that one's here in pink. Uh, and I think, I think next month this is going to jump up a little bit. So I, you know, I think there's a really good possibility that this um, El Nino event is going to be definitely in the top three of the strongest events that we've seen on record since 1950. Um, you can kind of see some of these others that, that people are probably interested in. Uh, the 1983 event, you might notice here in kind of the light blue, you can see that one kind of has the reputation for, for just immense amounts of stream flow, particularly in the, the Colorado River Basin uh, and in California. It kind of got off to a slower start before peaking uh, much later um, in the season. And um, so, you know, I don't know how this ENSO event is going to compare to the 1983 event or even the 1998 event, which is the, the strongest on record when you just look at the, the temperature departures. Uh, but it's going to fall in that range. Uh, both of those years were, were above average years uh, as far as the um, uh, precip conditions go. Uh, but you can see just that there's a lot of variability in how these strong El Nino events uh, develop and then also how they, they tend to uh, dissipate going into the, the spring and summer months. So uh, if you go to the NOAA website and the, what used to be called the National Climatic Data Center and now it's called NCEI, I'm not a hundred, I can't remember exactly what the acronym uh, stands for uh, right now, but uh, it's the same place. But if you go there, there's a cool tool that allows you to take a look at um, different anomalies and kind of composite them together so you could take a look at different uh, years and, and kind of splice them all together. So from a precipitation standpoint, if you look at those six strong El Nino events, you can see, like I kind of stressed before, there's a lot of variability um, between all the ENSO events that we've seen, all the El Nino events that we've seen, and, um, and even just between these six strong ones. You can see we've had the very wet 82, 83, uh, pretty wet 97, 98. But 1991, 1992, especially for Northern California, pretty dry. 65, 66 was pretty dry for everybody um, in, in our area of interest. Um, 72, 73 had more of that classic El Nino pattern. Um, but you can see none of these really just kind of uh, make you think, oh, this is how it's always going to be. And so when you kind of splice them all together, you do see that um, that general trend of that wet band that goes across the southern part of the continental uh, U.S., kind of the drier areas in the Pacific Northwest. And we can do the same for temperature, too. And you can kind of see, uh, you know, a bit of a cooler trend kind of in the, the southwest and kind of generally warmer uh, throughout the, the northern half of the U.S. there. But again, lots of variability. 72, 73, pretty cold uh, in the southwest. Um, you didn't really see those temperature impacts uh, through the north there. Um, kind of normal temperatures in 97, 98, um, 57, 58, you kind of saw those cooler temperatures extend um, into the east. So again, um, 
just because this is a strong El Nino event, we can't draw a lot of conclusions just because the past strong El Nino events have been so very different from each other. So what does this all mean for the Colorado River Basin and the desert LCC? So I think it's really important that those that we recognize that the, the areas that we know where the correlation is and um, where we do have some skill is, is mostly just in the lower Colorado uh, region in, in Southern California, uh, which we personally don't forecast for, but our, our friends over in the, the California and Nevada RFC do. Um, so that's where our skill really is. Um, it's also important to remember, again, that, that ENSO is an event that we correlate with precipitation and temperature. So there's a lot of other things that go into um, forecasting stream flow and, and actually into the stream flow that we actually observe um, than just precip. Uh, if you've got very dry soils, um, you might not see uh, as efficient a runoff as you might expect um, as those aquifers and dry soils uh, get replenished. Um, Conversely, if we had very, very wet soils, uh, maybe we only need a 80% um, of average precip to generate um, a flow that's close to average. So there's lots of these antecedent conditions um, and other factors that go into the stream flow that we ultimately see and um, how we forecast it uh, than just what the ENSO signal saying or just what we see um, or observe as precip. So I wanted to make uh, a plot showing how our stream flow for the upper Colorado River Basin, just because this plays such an important role to water supply in the lower Colorado River Basin, um, fared with the different uh, El Nino events. So GLDA3 here is, is just a fancy way for us to say Glen Canyon Dam. So, um, this is uh, unregulated uh, stream flow, April through July stream flow percent of average uh, at Glen Canyon Dam um, and the, the seasonal O and I. So what you can see here, so I, I put the CPC uh, strong events over here to the right. And um, in 1957, 1958, uh, there was no uh, Glen Canyon, so we don't have an unregulated flow value for that. But looking at reclamation's uh, uh, stream flow numbers, that was an above average year, but then 65, 66, a below average year, 72, 73, and above, 82, 83, above. But then 91, 92, we were below average again, 97, 98 was near average. So it's kind of this mixed bag with the, as far as stream flow and the strong uh, El Nino events in the upper Colorado River Basin. And you can just see the spread here. We've had some very wet years that were strong La Nina events. Um, we've had some uh, very dry years that were uh, El Nino events. And then we've had, um, you know, everything in between on the neutral years here. I think if you look at 83, 84, that was um, one of our, our wettest on record here. And it was a uh, decidedly neutral year that year. Kind of, um, oh, so I should back up really quick. Oops, sorry. So we kind of fit a linear regression to this, and you can see we don't have, you can see we're not drawing any kind of statistical um, relationship here, nothing that's significant at the 5% the level anyways. Um, but when we look in the lower Colorado River Basin, we do see um, a statistically significant correlation there. And so what we do there, because we do have some skill with, um, with the ENSO signal, uh, and the lower Colorado River Basin, is when we do our water supply forecast there, um, we remove the, the La Nina years, for example, in this year, and we just use the El Nino and the neutral years to develop our water supply forecast in the lower Colorado River Basin um, during a year like this. If this was a La Nina year, we would remove the El Nino years and um, do a forecast based on that. Oh, and just to just to stress that so we don't um, we don't use the ENSO uh, signal when we're making forecasts in the Upper Colorado River Basin or the Great Basin regions here. So, so just because it's an El Nino year, we're not that's not impacting how we develop our forecast 
um, um, in the upper Colorado River Basin or the Great Basin. And I can talk about that more if you're interested in that at the end of the presentation. Um, kind of looking more down south, though, in the, the desert LPC region and uh, the lower Colorado River Basin, here's where we're actually seeing um, uh, statistically significant uh, correlations here. So you can see here the, the Gila River and on the Virgin River, generally as you have a stronger El Nino event, you generally see um, uh, more stream flow and, and presumptively more uh, uh, wet conditions. Uh, but you can see there's, there's a lot of variability there. We have had some, some very wet uh, La Nina years, and we've had some dry El Nino years. Looking along the Little Colorado and the Verde River, you see kind of the same thing. So, you know, we're seeing that statistically significant um, uh, correlation there. But those correlation values aren't, aren't uh, high. So what I've been telling people is that we can tell you that in general, you're going to see more stream flow um, during an El Nino year uh, in the lower Colorado River Basin, but we can't tell you how much more. Uh, we, can, we can just kind of tell you the general trend. So just kind of looking at the latest projections here, um, current models are, are showing that this uh, INSO event is going to peak here in the next month or two and then start to uh, dampen throughout through spring. Um, we're likely to see uh, wetter conditions in the lower Colorado and desert LCC regions. We're crossing our fingers uh, that we'll see wetter conditions in the upper Colorado River Basin and Great Basin regions too, but that's um, uh, far from a sure thing uh, right now. And we think we're going to see warmer conditions in the western portion of the lower Colorado River Basin and the desert LCC. And I'll show you the latest CPC outlooks here. So here's the seasonal precipitation outlook for winter. And you can see there's a really good chance, uh, greater than 60%, that we're going to see uh, wetter conditions, uh, very southern Arizona, very southern California, and, you know, even um, weighted chances towards wetter conditions going through southern Utah and even into much of Colorado there. Um, so that's a, that's a good sign. We'll, we'll take it at this point. Uh, generally warmer conditions throughout much of the West. Uh, you can see just a, a bit cooler into uh, Texas. Um, thought that might be um, uh, of interest for a lot of the desert LCC folks. Um, yeah, just a bit cooler uh, throughout much of, of Texas. So how can we help here at the, the RFC? So we're able uh, to help any of you um, communicate physical basis for um, stream flow forecasts or, or even observe stream flow um, in your area. Um, we can provide forecasts for additional areas. I just kind of put up a snapshot of uh, a few of our water supply forecasts that, that people tend to be interested in. Uh, but if there's a location that you didn't see um, up there, let us know. Um, we might be already making that forecast, or if we, we can, might be able to work with you to, to generate a forecast. Um, and we can work with you to develop products that will suit your needs. Uh, we have lots of stuff on our website, lots of information on our website. Um, so if you, if you can't find what you're looking for, definitely give us a call, and, and we'll either help you find it or we'll um, work with you to, to help answer your questions or, or um, um, help with your decisions if we can. So here's a lot of useful links. Um, I think uh, Ken and Victoria mentioned that they're going to make the presentation available on YouTube. Uh, we've actually already posted this presentation on our website, so um, uh, feel free to go to our website and, and download it. Um, also feel free to email me uh, and I'll, I'll send you a copy. Uh, but just some of the, just some summaries here. Uh, NOAA's ENSO blog, uh, they started this last year. Um, last year's ENSO started out looking like it was going to be really big and it kind of fizzled. Um, so they started this really great blog and they've just kept it up. Um, and, and it's great. Like, I, if, if you really want to take a look at, understand ENSO and, and um, learn all kinds of new stuff, every time they post something, I learn something new. Um, it's just really great. It's in very accessible language. Um, they answer comments on the page um, uh, fairly regularly. 
uh, it, it's really great. I, I can't speak uh, highly enough of it. Uh, some more uh, um, information from the Climate Prediction Center. Uh, Columbia University's uh, ENSO page is really great. Uh, I took some of their pictures from this presentation uh, straight from there, uh, the historical O and I values. Our web page, of course, uh, there's not a lot of specific ENSO stuff on there, but lots of stream flow information and, and water supply information. I, I think that's the best one of them all. Um, if you're interested in things from a more international perspective, uh, the UK Met Office has a really great, some really great graphics on um, worldwide impacts due to ENSO, and Australia's Bureau, Bureau of Meteorology, Meteorology <laughs> also has some really good ones. Uh, CLEMIS, which is a, a NOAA um, uh, RISA uh, out of the University of Arizona, they've got a really cool um, El Nino page and, and lots of other resources there. And the Western Region Climate Center also has a, some, some great fact sheet information, some, some good educational resources on that page. Uh, I'm a big fan of them, too. Uh, here's just some people you can contact. Um, Michelle Stokes is our hydrologist in charge. Um, there's focal points for all the different uh, basin regions. Uh, they're listed here. Uh, I happen to be for the Great Basin. Um, here's a lot of the other people that, that uh, work to help us make successful forecasts. Uh, feel free to contact any of them as well. Uh, we have a Facebook page and a Twitter account, um, and uh, the more followers and tweeters, the better. Uh, so feel free to, to like us or, or tweet us. And if you have any questions, uh, feel free to, to email me. It's a, it's a really easy email address, paul.miller at noaa.gov, or, or feel free to to call too, I, I still answer phone calls. So uh, with that, um, yeah, if there's any questions or, or anything we can help with, um, I'd be glad to take them. Great, thanks so much, Paul. Uh, we do have some time for questions now. So if you do have a question, uh, you can raise your hand on your computer, going to the participants list and clicking the raise the hand button, which literally looks like a hand, Paul will be looking for those of you who have questions, looking for the raised hand, and he'll call the names out. If you hear your name called, please unmute yourself by pressing star six, and then you'll be able to ask your question and Paul will answer. We'll try to get to as many questions as we can with the remaining 15 minutes or so. And I see Victoria's typed in one, so I'll just, I'll just uh, read it so everybody can have it here. Um, oops, and this is a this is a long question. So this is from Doyle. Um, oh, sorry, call on Doyle. Okay, so I'm going to call on Doyle. Uh, so if you can just um, uh, press star six, and um, you can ask your question. Are you there, Doyle? Um, let me see. I, I think Victoria typed some of his question here, and I'll let me see if I can read it really quick to myself, and then I'll try and summarize here. Okay, so if I understand correctly, so Doyle's asking, um, he's talking about the different uh, pressure changes that happen during um, an ENSO event, whether that's um, El Nina or La Nina. Um, and in this presentation, I kind of uh, showed that, that that warmer ocean um, area uh, provides this energy that causes um, um, changes in the jet stream and the resultant uh, changes in climate that, that we typically see over the continental U.S. So he's asking if it's, the way I presented it, if it's, if it's the ocean that's initiating the atmosphere here, um, what causes the pressures to shift? Um, since the atmosphere is, is, I am doing an awful job of summarizing this, I'm sorry. 
Um, so here, I'll just, I'll just read it. This presentation mentioned uh, an ocean heat driver instead initiates the process with an atmospheric response. What is the source of heat that is not usually there? So uh, he's talking about the heat in the equatorial Pacific. Um, and that's a, that's a really good question. Um, I'll have to, you know, I don't, I don't know the ocean dynamics well enough to, to answer that question uh, probably, but my guess is that it's, um, you know, shifts in the, the, the winds and um, general kind of earth circulations that, that kind of slosh back and forth. Uh, that's a really non-technical answer. Um, but I, I can talk with uh, some folks over at the Climate Prediction Center that, that know much more about the, the ocean dynamics than I do, and um, I will get an answer to you. Hey, Paul, this is Ken. Do you mind if I chime in a little bit? Yeah, no, go for it. Um, so one of the, the sort of factors, as I understand it, is that, you know, normally you've got in the equator um, all this water sitting there, and it's getting warmed um, by being in the equator. And typically, you've got wind moving towards the west. And so what that does is it pulls that warm water and it pulls it um, further west. And so what that does is it actually creates a, an upwelling of cooler water um, along the uh, western coast of South America. And, and that's really what I think they generally consider to be a normal condition. Um, when that westerly wind moving water further across, all the warm water pooling um, becomes sort of exacerbated. Um, that's a La Nina where you actually see colder than average temperatures off the, the western coast of South America. And then what really causes an, an El Nino, I think, or at least is, is a, a contributing factor is this idea of stagnation of those westerly winds where you're not getting um, that warm pool, all that surface water at the equator getting pushed west, and that thermocline that's pulling up the cooler water off the coast of South America um, really breaks down, and then all of a sudden you've got stagnation. You see that warm pool migrating across. And so I think like that's one of the, f the factors here, but I'd, I'd love to hear what um, – some of the other folks that you work with have to say about it. Yeah, no, that that sounds uh, yeah, that sounds like a, a that sounds like the right answer to me. But I'll I'll uh, hit up uh, some of the folks at the Climate Prediction Center and, and ask them that. But I think that's that sounds right to me. <laughs> uh, let me see if I see any more uh, hands here. Oh, Brett Bruce is asking uh, if there's any atmospheric river events uh, associated with anomalous uh, westerly winds during uh, positive El Nino events. Um, you know, in 82, was it uh, the 83 event, uh, there was an atmospheric river that um, kind of brought a lot of that precipitation uh, to California and the Colorado River Basin. But I don't know if I'd go so far as to say atmospheric rivers are associated with ENSO events. Um, and this might just be a lack of, of observational data. We only have uh, sea surface temperature data that, that's reliable back to um, about 1950. And we've only had about, oh gosh, uh, 20 or so uh, um, El Nino events. So we don't have a lot of um, we just don't have a lot of observational um, evidence to go by. But there has been there's definitely been atmospheric events during um, El Nino uh, events, and there's also been atmospheric river events during La Nina events. So um, the the strength of those atmospheric rivers um, that I'm not I'm not quite sure um, if there's a if there's a strong correlation there, but it might just be due to lack of observational data. But that's a really good question. Oh, I see some more hands here. Um, so I'll call on uh, Miguel. You just hit uh, star six. Should be able to. 
Hi, uh, my name is Miguel Pavon. I'm a physical oceanographer, and we spent a good semester studying El Nino events at uh, uh, school. Uh, what happened is there is two kind of two main cells of circulations in the Pacific. The the northern Pacific goes uh, clockwise, so current comes from Alaska to California to Mexico, and then west on the on the equator, and then comes up north in Japan. And in the south is the opposite; it's countercurrent, so it comes from uh, Chile all the way to the equator, and then goes uh, west as well. There is an equ equatorial countercurrent that goes um, east. It goes from west to east. What happens during Nino events is that the circulation patterns get diminished, and the countercurrent gets stronger. That prevents uh, the warm water from being pushed west and stays longer near the equator. The fisheries near Chile suffer from that because there is less upwelling, and that's why they call it El Niño, thinking that uh, the, the baby Jesus was taking its fur of fish from them, uh, because it happened over, over December, over Christmas. So that's what happened circulation-wise. Okay. I hope that yeah, helps. That that, that that that's all. Thanks, uh, thanks uh, so much. I, I like the. I, I didn't know where the. I knew what El Nino meant in Spanish, but I didn't know what the, the, the origins was with the the fish. So yeah, thanks. Yeah, it, 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 just, it just it was just a coincidence of the decline of the fisheries during Christmas. Oh yeah, that, that's. Uh, I'm gonna I'm gonna tell that uh, to folks. <laughs> okay. Going forward, thank thanks so much. I appreciate. You you're welcome. Um, looks like Seth uh, Shanahan has got his hand up. Um, so I guess just press star six and you'll be on. Hey, Paul, can you hear me? Yep. All right. Hey, thanks so much for the presentation. I've got sure. three questions, so feel free to cut me off if I'm taking too much time. Oh, I think you're good. All right. The first was um, on slide eight, you showed the oceanic. Nino index values that you all use to kind of understand the, the uh, El Nino effects and, and whatnot. Is is there a a report or a similar body of uh, information that you could point me to that that you guys use to kind of convince yourselves that that's the most applicable index to use for your purposes, or is that mostly just best professional judgment from one uh, professional talking to another in the industry? Yeah, um, that's a really good question. And actually, the latest um, the latest entry in the Enso blog uh, speaks just to that. Um, so, like like Seth kind of um, insinuated, there's lots of these different indices that are um, that are used, and lots of these different regions that are looked at. And uh, in the latest Enso blog, and maybe I can bring it up here. If you just Google Enso blog, by the way, it, it's the first thing that, that pops up. Um, if you if you take a look at that entry, it goes into uh, detail all the different research that's gone into uh, not only how the data is measured and um, adjusted for biases uh, throughout the historical record, but also why that Nino 3.4 indice is the best for um, for the United States, and it, it provides a lot of um, sources, uh, academic sources that have gone through and done the analysis. Um, but yeah, that's a, that's a really uh, great question. Okay. So yeah, we basically we re we rely on it because that's that's the official one that that NOAA relies on. Oh, it is. Okay, gotcha. No, that's helpful to hear. Okay, my second question was on slide 24. If you wouldn't mind, maybe just bringing yeah. that up for a second. Sure. Oh, sorry, I can't navigate this mouse very well. Uh, 24. Oops, there we go. So you have uh, the ONI listed. Which season do you use? In this graphic for your relationship. Oh, that, that's a good question. So what I do um, 
is um, I average the, um, the O and I value for each event um, to, to develop these graphics. Um, I actually had a really interesting conversation with the CPC. There's no official way to determine the strength of, um, of an El Nino event or a La Nina event. Um, some people kind of take the average O and I value over, over the, the course of the event, or some people look at the peak O and I value. Um, so what I did was I just took the, the average O and I value um, over the event. So I start, um, I start with the June, July, August seasonal value, and I'll, uh, I'll kind of use this graphic up here. Let's see, where is it? Kind of early on, there it is. So I, I start with, um, yeah, I think I start with June, July, August um, as sort of being the, the first, uh, because most of the, most of the events tend to start about here. So I, I'll start with like June, July, August, and I'll go into the next year with uh, May, June, July. But for instance, for 2004, I'll average the, the starting from this point of five to this point of five, I'll average those O and I values and then plot it up against the stream flow. Oh, okay, I gotcha. Interesting. But if somebody has another way that they prefer to to see that, uh, I can I can totally work with you on that. Yeah, no, it's, no, it's just neat to know how you're doing it for sure. Okay, and, and then the last question I had, um, it was on slide 25, but you don't need to bring it up. It's um, you mentioned something about for the lower basin forecast, you, uh, as part of the forecast, remove the El Nino or La Nina years, kind of depending on if it's an El Nino or La Nina, La Nina right. condition. Um, just wanted to understand a little bit more of the thinking associated with that and, and kind of the thinking that led to making that kind of decision. Sure. So. Um you know, if you look at, um, let's see if I have a, oops, I go back to this graphic here. And, and perhaps maybe contrasting that with why you wouldn't do it in the upper base, it might be helpful. Right. So, so I think this graphic will, will kind of help explain. So this air, these shaded regions, those are regions where, um, um, the Climate Prediction Center and, and I guess NOAA in general, that's where we have statistical, um, uh, I shouldn't say that, that's where we have uh, skill um, in relating uh, an El Nino event uh, or a La Nina event. Um, and actually, I should just say, this is just where we have skill relating a El Nino event uh, to particular areas in the, um, uh, the continental U.S. And so we do have some skill in um, looking at the El Nino event and um, forecasting precipitation and temperature throughout the south here, uh, but we don't have that same skill um, in the upper Colorado River Basin. So there's a, um, so because we don't have any skill associated with um, um, forecasting um, based on ENSO uh, in the upper Colorado River Basin, um, we don't we don't use ENSO as a as a factor. So when you see that that plot here with uh, Glen Canyon, um, and you see like just a, a broad spread, you see this kind of general pattern in the Green River Basin, the Gunnison River Basin. Um, a lot of those, those northern things, you just see this very kind of shotgun blast um, uh, plot, kind of plot. When we get to the lower basin, we see more of this. So you can kind of see there's a general trend towards, you know, a stronger El Nino event, more stream flow, um, uh, a stronger La Nina event, less stream flow. Uh, so that's why, so we have skill there. Um, um, when using ENSO to, to forecast stream flow. It's, it's not great, but it does help some. So, uh, so that's why we use it down there. Thanks, Paul. Sure.
And it looks like uh, we've got a question Victoria typed in. Um, have you or others at the CBRC looked at the timing of the spring runoff peak uh, in the larger ENSO years versus uh, neutral and La Nina? Um, we haven't looked at it yet, but uh, I'm actually working on that, uh, looking at the, the timing of the peak. Um, a lot of the times we're, we're just, um, when we're doing the water supply forecast, um, most people have just been interested in the, the total volume. Um, so that's what we've been looking at, at right now, but that's sort of the next step in the process is, is looking at the timing um, um, of that peak. Uh, also looking at the timing of, um, of uh, snowpack accumulation and, and snow melt at snow tile stations too. So, so those are things that we're working on right now, but we haven't um, looked at the peak yet as it relates to, to the ENSO event. Um, I think that's everybody with the exception if Doyle happens to be back on the, the phone. I think that's everybody. Ah, okay. Uh, uh, this is Doyle. Oh, hi. I, I'm sorry. I guess I couldn't work my mute button correctly, but uh, I listened to everything you said. I sent you an email so um, you know, for you to look at later. So thank you. Yep, no problem. All right, well, um, it is the top of the hour, and so we want to be respectful of everyone's time. I'll just uh, thank you all for participating, and special thanks to Paul for making the time to be with us today. As a reminder, this webinar was recorded and will be made available on our YouTube channel. You can access the channel through the DLCC website, or you can Google DLCC YouTube, and it will pop up. Uh, thanks again, everyone, and, and have a great day.